This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three The Track of a Storm. Chapter Nine The Game Made. While Sidney Carton and the sheep of the prisons were in the adjoining dark room, speaking so low that not a sound was heard, Mr. Lorry looked at Jerry in considerable doubt and mistrust. That honest tradesman's manner of receiving the look did not inspire confidence. He changed the leg on which he rested as often as if he had fifty of those limbs, and were trying them all. He examined his fingernails with a very questionable closeness of attention, and whenever Mr. Lorry's eyes caught his, he was taken with that peculiar kind of short cough requiring the hollow of a hand before it, which is seldom, if ever, known to be an infirmity attendant on perfect openness of character. "'Jerry,' said Mr. Lorry, "'come here.' Mr. Cruncher came forward sideways, with one of his shoulders in advance of him. "'What have you been besides a messenger?' After some cogitation, accompanied with an intent look at his patron, Mr. Cruncher conceived the luminous idea of replying, "'Agricultural character.' "'My mind misgives me much,' said Mr. Lorry, angrily shaking a forefinger at him, "'that you have used the respectable and great house of Telson's as a blind, and that you have had an unlawful occupation of an infamous description. If you have, don't expect me to befriend you when you get back to England. If you have, don't expect me to keep your secret. Telson shall not be imposed upon. I hope, sir, pleaded the abashed Mr. Cruncher, that a gentleman like yourself, what I had the honor of odd jobbing till I'm gray at it, would think twice about harming of me, even if it was so. I don't say it is, but even if it was. And which it is to be took into account that, if it was, it wouldn't, even then, be all on one side. There'd be two sides to it. There might be medical doctors at the present hour, a pickin up their guineas, where an honest tradesman don't pick up his fardens. Fardens, no, nor yet his half fardens, half fardens, no, nor yet his quarter. A banking away like smoke at Telson's, and a cocking their medical eyes at that tradesman on the sly, a goin in and goin out to their own carriages, ah, equally like smoke if not more so. Well, that'd be imposing, too, on Telson's, for you cannot sarse the goose and not the gander. And here's Mrs. Cruncher, or leastways was in the old England times, and would be to-morrow, if cause given, a floppin' again the business to that degree as is ruinating, stark ruinating. Whereas them medical doctors' wives don't flop, catch em at it. Or if they flop, their toppings go in favor of more patients, and how can you rightly have one without t'other? Well, what with undertakers, and what with parish clerks, and what with sextons, and what with private watchmen, all the warishness and all in it, a man wouldn't get much by it, even if it was so. And what little a man did get would never prosper with him, Mr. Lorry. He'd never have no good of it. He'd want all along to be out of the line if he could see his way out, being once in, even if it was so. "'Ugh!' cried Mr. Lorry, rather relenting nevertheless. "'I am shocked at the sight of you.' "'Now, what I would humbly offer to you, sir,' pursued Mr. Cruncher, "'even if it was so, which I don't say it is.' "'Don't prevaricate,' said Mr. Lorry. "'No, I will not, sir,' returned Mr. Cruncher, "'as if nothing were further from his thoughts or practice. "'Which I don't say it is. "'What I would humbly offer to you, sir, would be this. "'Upon that there stool, at that there bar, "'sets that there boy of mine, "'brought up and growed up to be a man, "'what will errand you, message you, "'general light job you, "'till your heels is where your head is, "'if such should be your wishes. "'If it was so, which I don't say it is, "'for I will not prevaricate to you, sir,' Let that there boy keep his father's place, and take care of his mother. Don't blow upon that boy's father. Do not do it, sir. And let that father go into the line of the regular diggin', and make amends for what he would have undug, if it was so, by diggin' of him in with a will, and with convictions respecting the future keepin' of him safe. That, Mr. Lorry, said Mr. Cruncher, wiping his forehead with his arm, as an announcement that he had arrived at the peroration of his discourse, is what I would respectfully offer to you, sir. A man don't see all this here a goin' on dreadful round him, in the way of subjects without heads, dear me, plentiful enough for him to bring the price down to Porteridge, and hardly that, without having his serious thoughts of things. And these here would be mine, if it was so, entreatin' of you for to bear in mind that what I just said now, up and I said in the good cause where I might have kept it back. 
"'That at least is true,' said Mr. Lorry. "'Say no more now. "'It may be that I shall yet stand your friend, if you deserve it, "'and repent in action, not words. "'I want no more words.' Mr. Cruncher knuckled his forehead as Sidney Carton and the spy returned from the dark room. "'Adieu, Mr. Barsad, said the former. "'Our arrangement thus made, you have nothing to fear from me.' He sat down in a chair on the hearth, over against Mr. Lorry. When they were alone, Mr. Lorry asked him what he had done. "'Not much. If it should go ill with the prisoner, I have ensured access to him once.' Mr. Lorry's countenance fell. "'It is all I could do,' said Carton. "'To propose too much would be to put this man's head under the axe, "'and, as he himself said, nothing worse could happen to him if he were denounced. "'It was obviously the weakness of the position. "'There is no help for it.' "'But access to him,' said Mr. Lorry, "'if it should go ill before the tribunal, will not save him.' "'I never said it would.' "'Mr. Lorry's eyes gradually sought the fire. "'His sympathy with his darling and the heavy disappointment of his second arrest— gradually weakened them. He was an old man now, overborne with anxiety of late, and his tears fell. "'You are a good man and a true friend,' said Carton, in an altered voice. "'Forgive me if I notice that you are affected. I could not see my father weep and sit by careless, and I could not respect your sorrow more if you were my father. You are free from that misfortune, however.' Though he said the last words with a slip into his usual manner, there was a true feeling and respect, both in his tone and in his touch, that Mr. Lorry, who had never seen the better side of him, was wholly unprepared for. He gave him his hand, and Carton gently pressed it. "'To return to poor Darnay,' said Carton, "'don't tell her of this interview or this arrangement. It would not enable her to go to see him. She might think it was contrived, in case of the worst, to convey him the means of anticipating the sentence.' Mr. Lorry had not thought of that, and he looked quickly at Carton to see if it were in his mind. It seemed to be, for he returned the look and evidently understood it. "'She might think a thousand things,' said Carton, "'and any of them would only add to her trouble. "'Don't speak to me of her. "'As I said to you when I first came, I had better not see her. "'I can put my hand out to do any little helpful work for her "'that my hand can find to do without that. "'You are going to her, I hope? "'She must be very desolate to-night.' I am going now directly. I am glad of that. She has such a strong attachment to you and reliance on you. How does she look? Anxious and unhappy, but very beautiful. Ah! Uh, it was a long, grieving sound, like a sigh, almost a sob. It attracted Mr. Lorry's eyes to Carton's face, which was turned to the fire. A light, or a shade, the old gentleman could not have said which, passed from it as swiftly as a change will sweep over the side hill on a wild, bright day, and he lifted his foot to put back one of those little flaming logs which was tumbling forward. He wore the white riding coat and top boots then in vogue, and the light of the fire touching their light surfaces made them look very pale, with his long brown hair all untrimmed hanging loose about him. His indifference to fire was sufficiently remarkable to elicit a word of remonstrance from Mr. Lorry. His boot was still upon the hot embers of the flaming log, when it had broken under the weight of his foot. "'I had forgot it,' he said. Mr. Lorry's eyes were again attracted to his face. Taking note of the wasted air which clouded the naturally handsome features, and having the expression of prisoners' faces fresh in his mind, he was strongly reminded of that expression." "'And your duties here have drawn to an end, sir?' said Carton, turning to him. "'Yes. As I was telling you last night when Lucy came in so unexpectedly, I have at length done all that I can do here. I hope to have left them in perfect safety, and then to have quitted Paris. I have my leave to pass. I was ready to go.' They were both silent. "'Yours is a long life to look back upon, sir,' said Carton, wistfully. "'I am in my seventy-eighth year.' You have been useful all your life, steadily and constantly occupied, trusted, respected, and looked up to. I have been a man of business ever since I have been a man. Indeed, I may say that I was a man of business when I was a boy. See what a place you fill at seventy-eight. How many people will miss you when you leave it empty? A solitary old bachelor, answered Mr. Lorry, shaking his head. There is nobody to weep for me. How can you say that? "'Wouldn't she weep for you? Wouldn't her child?' "'Yes, yes, thank God. I didn't quite mean what I said.' 
It is a thing to thank God for, is it not? Surely, surely. If you could say with truth to your own solitary heart tonight, I have secured to myself the love and attachment, the gratitude or respect of no human creature. I have won myself a tender place in no regard. I have done nothing good or serviceable to be remembered by. Your seventy-eight years would be seventy-eight heavy curses, would they not? You say truly, Mr. Carton. I think they would be. Sidney turned his eyes again upon the fire, and after a silence of a few moments said, I should like to ask you, does your childhood seem far off? Do the days when you sat at your mother's knee seem days of very long ago? Responding to his softened manner, Mr. Lorry answered, Twenty years back, yes, at this time of my life, no. For as I draw closer and closer to the end, I travel in the circle, nearer and nearer to the beginning. It seems to be one of the kind smoothings and preparings of the way. My heart is touched now by many remembrances that had long fallen asleep, of my pretty young mother and I so old, and by many associations of the days when what we call the world was not so real with me, and my faults were not confirmed in me. "'I understand the feeling,' exclaimed Carton, with a bright flush. "'And are you the better for it?' "'I hope so.' Carton terminated the conversation here by rising to help him on with his outer coat. "'But you,' said Mr. Lorry, reverting to the theme, "'you are young.' Yes, said Carton, I am not old, but my young way was never the way to age. Enough of me. And of me, I am sure, said Mr. Lorry. Are you going out? I'll walk with you to her gate. You know my vagabond and restless habits. If I should prowl about the streets a long time, don't be uneasy. I shall reappear in the morning. You go to the court tomorrow? Yes, unhappily. I shall be there, but only as one of the crowd. My spy will find a place for me. Take my arm, sir. Mr. Lorry did so, and they went downstairs and out into the streets. A few minutes brought them to Mr. Lorry's destination. Carton left him there, but lingered at a little distance, and turned back to the gate again when it was shut and touched it. He had heard of her going to the prison every day. She came out here, he said, looking about him. Turned this way. Must have trod on these stones often. Let me follow in her steps. It was ten o'clock at night when he stood before the prison of La Force, where she had stood hundreds of times. A little wood sawyer, having closed his shop, was smoking his pipe at the shop door. "'Good night, citizen,' said Sidney Carton, pausing and going by, for the man eyed him inquisitively. "'Good night, citizen.' "'How goes the Republic?' "'You mean the guillotine. Not ill. Sixty-three today. We shall mount to a hundred soon.' Samson and his men complain sometimes of being exhausted. Ha, ha, ha! He is so droll, that Samson, such a barber. Do you often go to see him? Shave? Always, every day. What a barber! You have seen him at work? Never. Go and see him when he has a good batch. Figure this to yourself, citizen. He shaved the sixty-three today, in less than two pipes. Less than two pipes! Word of honor! As the grinning little man held out the pipe he was smoking to explain how he timed the executioner, Carton was so sensible of a rising desire to strike the life out of him that he turned away. "'But you are not English,' said the wood sawyer, "'though you wear English dress.' "'Yes,' said Carton, pausing again and answering over his shoulder. "'You speak like an old Frenchman.' "'I am an old student here.' "'Aha! A perfect Frenchman! Good night, Englishman!' Good night, citizen. But go and see that droll dog, the little man persisted, calling after him, and take a pipe with you. Sidney had not gone far out of sight when he stopped in the middle of the street under a glimmering lamp and wrote with his pencil on a scrap of paper. Then, traversing with the decided step of one who remembered the way well, several dark and dirty streets, much dirtier than usual, for the best public thoroughfares remained uncleansed in those times of terror, he stopped at his chemist's shop which the owner was closing with his own hands. A small, dim, crooked shop, kept in torturous uphill thoroughfare, by a small, dim, crooked man. Giving this citizen two good night, as he confronted him at his counter, he laid the scrap of paper before him. Whew! the chemist whistled softly as he read it. 
Hi, hi, hi. Sidney Carton took no heed, and the chemist said, For you, citizen? For me. You will be careful to keep them separate, citizen. You know the consequences of mixing them? Perfectly. Certain small packets were made and given to him. He put them one by one in the breast of his inner coat, counted out the money for them, and deliberately left the shop. There is nothing more to do, said he, glancing upwards at the moon, until tomorrow. I can't sleep. It was not a reckless manner, the manner in which he said these words aloud under the fast-sailing clouds, nor was it more expressive of negligence than defiance. It was the settled manner of a tired man, who had wandered and struggled and got lost, but who at length struck into his road and saw its end. Long ago, when he had been famous among his early editors as a youth of great promise, he had followed his father to the grave. His mother had died years before. These solemn words, which had been read at his father's grave, arose in his mind as he went down the dark streets, among the heavy shadows, with the moon and the clouds sailing on high above him. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. In a city dominated by the axe, alone at night, with natural sorrow rising in him for the sixty-three who had been that day put to death, and for tomorrow's victims then awaiting their doom in the prisons, and still of tomorrow's and tomorrow's the chain of association that brought the words home, like a rusty old ship's anchor from the deep, might have been easily found. He did not seek it, but repeated them and went on. With a solemn interest in the lighted windows where the people were going to rest, forgetful through a few calm hours of the horrors surrounding them, in the towers of the churches, where no prayers were said, for the popular revulsion had even travelled that length of self-destruction from years of priestly impostors, plunderers, and profligates, in the distant burial-places reserved, as they rode upon the gates, for eternal sleep, in the abounding gales, and in the streets along which the sixties rolled to a death which had become so common and material, that no sorrowful story of a haunting spirit ever arose among the people out of all the working of the guillotine. With a solemn interest in the whole life and death of the city settling down to its short nightly pause and fury, Sidney Carton crossed the Seine again for the lighter streets. Few coaches were abroad, for riders and coaches were liable to be suspected, and gentility hid its head in red nightcaps, and put on heavy shoes, and trudged. But the theatres were all well filled, and the people poured cheerfully out as he passed, and went chatting home. At one of the theatre doors there was a little girl with a mother, looking for a way across the street through the mud. He carried the child over, and before the timid arm was loosed from his neck, asked her for a kiss. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now that the streets were quiet, and the night wore on, the words were in the echoes of his feet, and were in the night air. Perfectly calm and steady, he sometimes repeated them to himself as he walked, but he always heard them. The night wore out, and, as he stood upon the bridge listening to the water as it splashed the river walls of the island of Paris, where the picturesque confusion of houses and cathedrals shone bright in the light of the moon, the day came coldly, looking like a dead face out of the sky. Then the night, with the moon and the stars, turned pale and died, and for a little while it seemed as if creation were delivered over to death's dominion. But the glorious sun rising seemed to strike those words, that burden of the night, straight and warm to his heart in its long bright rays. And looking along them, with reverently shaded eyes, a bridge of light appeared to span the air between him and the sun, while the river sparkled under it. The strong tide, so swift, so deep and certain, was like a congenial friend in the morning stillness. He walked by the stream, far from the houses, and in the light and warmth of the sun, fell asleep on the bank. When he awoke and was afoot again, he lingered there yet a little longer, watching an eddy that turned and turned, purposeless, 
until the stream absorbed it and carried it on to the sea. Like me. A trading boat, with a sail of softened color of a dead leaf, then glided into his view, floated by him, and died away. As its silent track in the water disappeared, the prayer that had broken up out of his heart for merciful consideration of all his poor blindnesses and arrows ended in the words, I am the resurrection and the life. Mr. Lorry was already out when he got back, and it was easy to surmise where the old man was gone. Sidney Carton drank nothing but a little coffee, ate some bread, and, having washed and changed to refresh himself, went out to the place of trial. The court was all a stir and a buzz when the black sheep, whom many fell away from in dread, pressed him into an obscure corner among the crowd. Mr. Lorry was there, and Dr. Manette was there. She was there, sitting beside her father. When her husband was brought in, she turned to look upon him, so sustaining, so encouraging, so full of admiring love and pitying tenderness, yet so courageous for his sake, that it called the healthy blood into his face, brightened his glance, and animated his heart. If there had been any eyes to notice the influence of her look on Sidney Carton, it would have been seen to be the same influence exactly. Before that unjust tribunal there was little or no order of procedure, ensuring to any accused person any reasonable hearing. There could have been no such revolution if all laws, forms, and ceremonies had not first been so monstrously abused that the suicidal vengeance of the revolution was to scatter them all to the winds. Every eye was turned to the jury. The same determined patriots and good republicans as yesterday and the day before and tomorrow and the day after. Eager and prominent among them, one man with a craving face, his fingers perpetually hovering about his lips, whose appearance gave great satisfaction to the spectators. A life-thirsting, cannibal-looking, bloody-minded juryman, the Jacques III of Saint Antoine, the whole jury, as a jury of dogs, epinamel to try the deer. Every eye then turned to the five judges and the public prosecutor. No favorable leaning in that quarter today. A fell, uncompromising, murderous business meaning there. Every eye then sought some other eye in the crowd, and gleamed at it approvingly, and heads nodded at one another, before bending forward with a strained attention. Charles Evermond called Darnay, released yesterday, reaccused and retaken yesterday, indictment delivered to him last night, suspected and denounced enemy of the Republic, aristocrat, one of a family of tyrants, one of a race proscribed, for that they had used their abolished privileges to the infamous oppression of the people. Charles Evermond called Darnay, in right of such proscription, absolutely dead in law. To this effect, in as few or fewer words, the public prosecutor. The President asked, was the accused openly denounced or secretly? Openly, President. By whom? Three voices. Ernest Defarge, wine vendor of Saint Antoine, good. Therese Defarge, his wife, good. Alexandre Manette, physician. An uproar took place in the court, and in the midst of it, Dr. Manette was seen, pale and trembling, standing where he had been seated. President, I indignantly protest to you that this is a forgery and a fraud. You know the accused to be the husband of my daughter. My daughter, and those dear to her, are far dearer to me than my life. Who and where is the false conspirator who says that I denounce the husband of my child? Citizen Manette, be tranquil. To fail in submission to the authority of the tribunal would be to put yourself out of law. As to what is dearer to you than life, nothing can be so dear to a good citizen as the Republic." Loud acclamations hailed this rebuke. The President rang his bell, and with warmth resumed. If the Republic should demand of you the sacrifice of your child herself, you would have no duty but to sacrifice her. Listen to what is to follow. In the meantime, be silent. Frantic acclamations were again raised. Dr. Manette sat down, with his eyes looking around and his lips trembling. His daughter drew closer to him. The craving man on the jury rubbed his hands together and restored the usual hand to his mouth. 
Defarge was produced, when the court was quiet enough to admit of his being heard, and rapidly expounded the story of the imprisonment, and of his having been a mere boy in the doctor's service, and of the release, and of the state of the prisoner when released and delivered to him. This short examination followed, for the court was quick with its work. "'You did good service at the taking of the Bastille, citizen?' "'I believe so.' Here an excited woman screeched from the crowd. "'You were one of the best patriots there. Why not say so? You were a cannoneer that day there, and you were among the first to enter the accursed fortress when it fell. Patriots, I speak the truth.' It was the vengeance who, amidst the warm commendations of the audience, thus assisted the proceedings. The President rang his bell, but the vengeance, warming with encouragement, shrieked, I defy that bell, wherein she was likewise much commended. Inform the tribunal of what you did that day within the Bastille citizen. I knew, said Defarge, looking down at his wife, who stood at the bottom of the steps on which he was raised, looking steadily up at him. I knew that this prisoner, of whom I speak, had been confined in a cell known as 105 North Tower. I knew it from himself. He knew himself by no other name than 105 North Tower when he made shoes under my care. And I served my gun that day, I resolve, when the place shall fall, to examine that cell. It falls. I mount to the cell with a fellow citizen who is one of the jury directed by a gaoler. I examined it very closely. In a hole in the chimney, where a stone had been worked out and replaced, I find a written paper. This is that written paper. I have made it my business to examine some specimens of the writing of Dr. Manette. This is the writing of Dr. Manette. I confide this paper in the writing of Dr. Manette to the hands of the President. Let it be read. In a dead silence and stillness, the prisoner under trial looking lovingly at his wife, his wife only looking from him to look with solicitude at her father, Dr. Manette keeping his eyes fixed on the reader, Madame Defarge never taking hers from the prisoner, Defarge never taking his from his feasting wife, and all the other eyes were intent upon the doctor, who saw none of them. The paper was read as follows. End of chapter 9, The Game Made, read by Torah in Campbellsburg, Kentucky, November 2006.